This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Vain by Chrétien de Troyes. Translated by W. W. Comfort. Section 5. Then they say no more about the box, but minister in every way they can to the comfort of my lord of Ain, bathing him and washing his hair, having him shaved and clipped, for one could have taken up a fistful of hair upon his face. His every want is satisfied. If he asks for arms, they are furnished him. If he wants a horse, they provide him with one that is large and handsome, strong and spirited. He stays there until, upon a Tuesday, Count Allier came to the town with his men and knights, who started fires and took plunder. Those in the town at once rose up and equipped themselves with arms. Some armed and some unarmed, they issued forth to meet the plunderers, who did not deign to retreat before them, but awaited them in a narrow pass. My lord of Vane struck at the crowd, he had had so long a rest that his strength was quite restored, and he struck a knight upon his shield with such force that he sent down in a heap, I think, the knight together with his horse. The knight never rose again, for his backbone was broken and his heart burst within his breast. My lord Yvain drew back a little to recover. Then, protecting himself completely with his shield, he spurred forward to clear the pass. One could not have counted up to four before one would have seen him cast down speedily four knights. Whereupon, those who were with him waxed more brave, for many a man of poor and timid heart, at the sight of some brave man who attacks a dangerous task before his eyes, will be overwhelmed by confusion and shame, which will drive out the poor heart in his body, and give him another like to a hero's for courage. So these men grew brave, and each stood his ground in the fight and attack. And the lady was up in the tower, when she saw the fighting and the rush to win and gain possession of the pass, and she saw lying upon the ground many who were wounded and many killed, both of her own party and of the enemy, but more of the enemy than of her own. For my courteous, bold, and excellent lord of Aim made them yield just as a falcon does the teal. And the men and women who had remained within the town declared as they watched the strife, Ah, oh, what a valiant knight! How he makes his enemies yield, and how fierce is his attack! He was about him as a lion among the fallow deer, when he is impelled by need and hunger. Then, too, all our other knights are more brave and daring because of him, for, were it not for him alone, not a lance would have been splintered, nor a sword drawn to strike. When such an excellent man is found, he ought to be loved and dearly prized. See now how he proves himself. See how he maintains his place. See how he stains with blood his lance and bare sword. See how he presses the enemy and follows them up. How he comes boldly to attack them, then gives away and turns about. But he spends little time in giving away, and soon returns to the attack. See him in the fray again, how lightly he esteems his shield, which he allows to be cut in pieces mercilessly. Just see how keen he is to avenge the blows which are dealt at him. For, if someone should use all the forests of Argonne to make lances for him, I guess he would have none left by night. For he breaks all the lances they place in his socket, and calls for more. And see how he wields the sword when he draws it. Roland never wrought such havoc with Durandal against the Turks, at Roncesvalles or in Spain. If he had in his company some good companions like himself, the traitor, whose attack we are suffering, would retreat today discomfited, or would stand his ground only to find defeat. Then they say that the woman would be blessed who should be loved by one who is so powerful in arms, and who above all others may be recognized as a taper among candles, as a moon among the stars, and as the sun above the moon. He so won the hearts of all that the prowess which they see in him made them wish that he had taken their lady to wife, and that he were master of the land. Thus men and women alike praised him, and in doing so they but told the truth. For his attack on his adversaries was such that they vie with one another in flight, 
but he presses hard upon their heels, and all his companions follow him, for by his side they feel as safe as if they were enclosed in a high and thick stone wall. The pursuit continues until those who flee become exhausted, and the pursuers slash at them and disembowel their steeds. The living roll over upon the dead as they wound and kill each other. They work dreadful destruction upon each other, and meanwhile the Count flees, with my lord Yvain after him, until he comes up with him at the foot of a steep ascent, near the entrance of a strong place which belonged to the Count. There the Count was stopped, with no one near to lend him aid, and without any excessive parley my lord Yvain received his surrender. For as soon as he held him in his hands, and they were left just man to man, there was no further possibility of escape, or of yielding, or of self-defence. So the Count pledged his word to go surrender to the Lady of Norizon as her prisoner, and to make such peace as she might dictate. And when he had accepted his word, he made him disarm his head, and remove the shield from about his neck, and the Count surrendered to him his sword. Thus he won the honour of leading off the Count as his prisoner, and of giving him over to his enemies, who made no secret of their joy. But the news was carried to the town before they themselves arrived. While all come forth to meet them, the lady herself leads the way. My lord Yvain holds his prisoner by the hand, and presents him to her. The count gladly acceded to her wishes and demands, and secured her by his word, oath, and pledges. Giving her pledges, he swears to her that he will always live on peaceful terms with her, and will make good to her all the loss which she can prove, and will build up again the houses which he had destroyed. When these things were agreed upon, in accordance with the lady's wish, my lord Yvain asked leave to depart. But she would not have granted him this permission had he been willing to take her as his mistress, or to marry her. But he would not allow himself to be followed or escorted a single step, but rather departed hastily. In this case, entreaty was of no avail. So he started out to retrace his path, leaving the lady much chagrined whose joy he had caused a while before. When he will not tarry longer, she is the more distressed and ill at ease in proportion to the happiness he had brought her, for she would have wished to honour him, and would have made him, with his consent, lord of all her possessions, or else she would have paid him for his services, whatever sum he might have named. But he would not heed any word of man or woman. Despite their grief, he left the knights and the lady who vainly tried to detain him longer. Pensively my lord Yvain proceeded through a deep wood, until he heard among the trees a very loud and dismal cry, and he turned in the direction whence it seemed to come. And when he had arrived upon the spot, he saw in a cleared space a lion, and a serpent which held him by the tail, burning his hindquarters with flames of fire. My lord Yvain did not gape at this strange spectacle, but took counsel with himself as to which of the two he should aid. Then he says that he will suffer the lion, for a treacherous and venomous creature deserves to be harmed. Now the serpent is poisonous, and fire bursts forth from its mouth, so full of wickedness is the creature. So my lord Yvain decides that he will kill the serpent first. Drawing his sword, he steps forward holding the shield before his face in order not to be harmed by the flame emerging from the creature's throat, which was larger than a pot. If the lion attacks him next, he too shall have all the fight he wishes, but whatever may happen afterwards, he makes up his mind to help him now. For pity urges him, and makes request that he should bear succour and aid to the gentle and noble beast. With his sword, which cuts so clean, he attacks the wicked serpent, first cleaving him through to the earth, and cutting him in two, then continuing his blows until he reduces him to tiny bits. But he had to cut off a piece of the lion's tail to get at the serpent's head, which held the lion by the tail. He cut off only so much as was necessary and unavoidable. When he had set the lion free, he supposed that he would have to fight with him, and that the lion would come at him. But the lion was not minded so, just hear now what the lion did. He acted nobly, and as one well-bred, for he began to make it evident that he yielded himself to him, by standing upon his two hind feet and bowing his face to the earth, 
with his four feet joined and stretched out toward him. Then he fell on his knees again, and all his face was wet with the tears of humility. My lord Yvain knows for a truth that the lion is thanking him and doing him homage because of the serpent which he had killed, thereby delivering him from death. He was greatly pleased by this episode. He cleaned his sword of the serpent's poison and filth, then he replaced it in its scabbard and resumed his way. And the lion walks close by his side, unwilling henceforth to part from him. He will always in future accompany him, eager to serve and protect him. He goes ahead until he scents in the wind upon his way some wild beasts feeding. Then hunger in his nature prompts him to seek his prey and to secure his sustenance. It is in his nature to do so. He started ahead a little on the trail, thus showing his master that he had come upon and detected the odor and scent of some wild game. Then he looks at him and halts, wishing to serve his every wish, and unwilling to proceed against his will. Yvain understands by his attitude that he is showing that he awaits his pleasure. He perceives this, and understands that if he holds back, he will hold back too, and that if he follows him, he will seize the game which he has scented. Then he incites and cries to him, as he would do to hunting dogs. At once the lion directed his nose to the scent which he had detected, and by which he was not deceived, for he had not gone a bow-shot when he saw in the valley a deer grazing all alone. This deer he will seize, if he had his way. And so he did, at the first spring, and then drank its blood still warm. When he had killed it, he laid it upon his back, and carried it back to his master, who thereupon conceived a greater affection for him, and chose him as companion for all his life, because of the great devotion he found in him. It was near nightfall now, and it seemed good to him to spend the night there, and stripped from the deer as much as he cared to eat. Beginning to carve it, he splits the skin along the rib, and taking a stake from the loin, he strikes from a flint a spark, which he catches in some dry brushwood. Then he quickly puts his stake upon a roasting spit, to cook before the fire, and roasts it until it is quite cooked through. But there was no pleasure in the meal, for there was no bread, or wine, or salt, or cloth, or knife, or anything else. While he was eating, the lion lay at his feet, nor a movement did he make, but watched him steadily until he had eaten all that he could eat of the steak. What remained of the deer the lion devoured, even to the bones, and while all night his master laid his head upon his shield to gain such rest as that afforded, the lion showed such intelligence that he kept awake and was careful to guard the horse as it fed upon the grass, which yielded some slight nourishment. In the morning they go off together, in the same sort of existence, it seems, as they had led that night. They too continue to lead all the ensuing week, until chance brought them to the spring beneath the pine tree. There my lord Yvain almost lost his wits a second time, as he approached the spring with its stone in the chapel that stood close by. So great was his distress, that a thousand times he sighed, Alas! and grieving fell in a swoon and the point of his sharp sword, falling from its scabbard, pierced the meshes of his halberd right in the neck beside his cheek. There is not a mesh that does not spread, and the sword cuts the flesh of his neck beneath the shining mail, so that it causes the blood to start. Then the lion thinks that he sees his master and companion dead. You never heard a greater grief narrated or told about anything than he now began to show. He casts himself about, and scratches and cries, and has the wish to kill himself with the sword with which he thinks his master has killed himself. Taking the sword from him with his teeth, he lays it on a fallen tree, and steadies it on a trunk behind, so that it will not slip or give way when he hurls his breast against it. His intention was nearly accomplished when his master recovered from his swoon and the lion restrained himself as he was blindly rushing upon death, like a wild boar, heedless of where he wounds himself. Thus my lord Yvain lies in a swoon beside the stone, but, on recovering, he violently reproached himself for the year during which he had overstayed his leave, and for which he had incurred his lady's hate, and he said, Why does this wretch not kill himself, who has thus deprived himself of joy? 
Alas, why do I not take my life? How can I stay here and look upon what belongs to my lady? Why does the soul still tarry in my body? What is the soul doing in so miserable a frame? If it had already escaped away, it would not be in such torment. It is fitting to hate and blame and despise myself, even as in fact I do. Whoever loses his bliss and contentment through fault or error of his own ought to hate himself mortally. He ought to hate and kill himself. And now, when no one is looking on, why do I thus spare myself? Why do I not take my life? Have I not seen this lion a prey to such grief on my behalf that he was on the point just now of thrusting my sword through his breast? And ought I to fear death, who have changed happiness into grief? Joy is now a stranger to me. Joy? What joy is that? I shall say no more of that, for no one could speak of such a thing, and I have asked a foolish question. That was the greatest joy of all, which was assured as my possession, but it endured for but a little while. Whoever loses such joy through his own misdeed is undeserving of happiness. While he thus bemoaned his fate, a lorn damsel in sorry plight, who was in the chapel, saw him and heard his words through a crack in the wall. As soon as he was recovered from his swoon, she called to him. God, she said, who is that I hear? Who is it that thus complains? And he replied, and who are you? I am a wretched one, she said, the most miserable thing alive. And he replied, be silent, foolish one. Thy grief is joy and thy sorrow is bliss compared with that in which I am cast down. In proportion as a man becomes more accustomed to happiness and joy, so is he more distracted and stunned than any other man by sorrow when it comes. A man of little strength can carry, through custom and habit, a weight which another man of greater strength could not carry for anything. Upon my word, she said, I know the truth of that remark but that is no reason to believe that your misfortune is worse than mine. Indeed, I do not believe it at all, for it seems to me that you can go anywhere you choose to go, whereas I am imprisoned here, and such a fate is my portion that to-morrow I shall be seized and delivered to mortal judgment. Ah, God, said he, and for what crime? Sir Knight, may God never have mercy upon my soul, if I have merited such a fate. Nevertheless, I shall tell you truly, without deception, why I am here in prison. I am charged with treason, and I cannot find any one to defend me from being burned or hanged to-morrow. In the first place, he replied, I may say that my grief and woe are greater than yours, for you may yet be delivered by someone from the peril in which you are. Is that not true? Yes, but I know not yet by whom. There are only two men in the world who would dare on my behalf to face three men in battle. What? In God's name, are there three of them? Yes, sire, upon my word, there are three who accuse me of treachery. And who are they who are so devoted to you that either one of them would be bold enough to fight against three in your defense? I will answer your question truthfully. One of them is my lord Gawain, and the other is my lord Yvain, because of whom I shall to-morrow be handed over unjustly to the martyrdom of death. Because of whom? he asked. What did you say? Sire, so help me God, because of the son of King Urien. Now I understand your words, but you shall not die, without he dies too. I myself am that Yvain, because of whom you are in such distress. And you, I take it, are she who once guarded me safely in the hall, and saved my life and my body between the two portcullises, when I was troubled and distressed, and alarmed at being trapped. I should have been killed or seized, had it not been for your kind aid. Now tell me, my gentle friend, who are those who now accuse you of treachery, and have confined you in this lonely place? Sire, I shall not conceal it from you, since you desire me to tell you all. It is a fact that I was not slow in honestly aiding you. Upon my advice my lady received you, after heeding my opinion and my counsel. And by the holy paternoster, 
more for her welfare than for your own i thought i was doing it and i think so still so much now i confess to you it was her honour and your desire that i sought to serve so help me god but when it became evident that you had overstayed the year when you should return to my mistress then she became enraged at me and thought that she had been deceived by putting trust in my advice and when this was discovered by the seneschal a rascally underhanded disloyal wretch who was jealous of me because in many matters my lady trusted me more than she trusted him he saw that he could now stir up great enmity between me and her in full court and in the presence of all he accused me of having betrayed her in your favour and i had no counsel or aid except my own but i knew that i had never done or conceived any treacherous act towards my lady so i cried out as one beside herself and without the advice of any one that i would present in my own defence one knight who should fight against three the fellow was not courteous enough to scorn to accept such odds nor was i at liberty to retreat or withdraw for anything that might happen so he took me at my word and i was compelled to furnish bail that i would present within forty days a knight to do battle against three knights since then i have visited many courts i was at king arthur's court but found no help from any there nor did i find any one who could tell me any good news of you for they knew nothing of your affairs pray tell me where then was my good and gentle lord gawain no damsel in distress ever needed his aid without its being extended to her if i had found him at court i could not have asked him for anything which would have been refused me but a certain knight has carried off the queen so they told me surely the king was mad to send her off in his company i believe it was kay who escorted her to meet the knight who has taken her away my lord gawain in great distress has gone in search for her he will never have any rest until he finds her now i have told you the whole truth of my adventure to-morrow i shall be put to a shameful death and shall be burnt inevitably a victim of your criminal neglect and he replies may god forbid that you should be harmed because of me so long as i live you shall not die you may expect me to-morrow prepared to the extent of my power to present my body in your cause as it is proper that i should do but have no concern to tell the people who i am however the battle may turn out take care that i be not recognized surely sire no pressure could make me reveal your name i would sooner suffer death since you will have it so yet after all i beg you not to return for my sake i would not have you undertake a battle which will be so desperate i thank you for your promised word that you would gladly undertake it but consider yourself now released for it is better that i should die alone than that i should see them rejoice over your death as well as mine they would not spare my life after they had put you to death so it is better for you to remain alive than that we both should meet death that is a very ungrateful remark my dear says my lord of Aine. I suppose that either you do not wish to be delivered from death, or else that you scorn the comfort I bring you with my aid. I will not discuss the matter more, for you have surely done so much for me that I cannot fail you in any need. I know that you are in great distress, but if it be God's will, in whom I trust, they shall all three be discomfited. So no more upon that score. I am going off now to find some shelter in this wood, for there is no dwelling near at hand. Sire, she says, may God give you both good shelter and good night, and protect you as I desire from everything that might do you harm. Then my lord of Ain departs, and the lion as usual after him. They journeyed until they came to a baron's fortified place, which was completely surrounded by a massive, strong, and high wall. The castle, being extraordinarily well protected, feared no assault of catapult or storming machine, but outside the walls the ground was so completely cleared that not a single hut or dwelling remained standing. You will learn the cause of this a little later, when the time comes. My lord of Bain made his way directly towards the fortified place, and seven varlets came out who lowered the bridge and advanced to meet him. But they were terrified at the sight of the lion, which they saw with him, and asked him kindly to leave the lion at the gate, 
lest he should wound or kill them. And he replies, Say no more of that, for I shall not enter without him. Either we shall both find shelter here, or else I shall stay outside. He is as dear to me as I am myself. Yet you need have no fear of him, for I shall keep him so well in hand that you may be quite confident. They made answer, Very well. Then they entered the town, and passed on until they met knights and ladies and charming damsels coming down the street, who salute him, and wait to remove his armour as they say, Welcome to our midst, fair sire, and may God grant that you tarry here until you may leave with great honour and satisfaction. High and low alike extend to him a glad welcome, and do all they can for him, as they joyfully escort him into the town. But after they had expressed their gladness, they are overwhelmed by grief, which makes them quickly forget their joy, as they begin to lament and weep and beat themselves. Thus, for a long space of time, they cease not to rejoice or make lament. It is to honour their guests that they rejoice, but their heart is not in what they do, for they are greatly worried over an event which they expect to take place on the following day, and they feel very sure and certain that it will come to pass before midday. My lord Yvain was so surprised that they so often changed their mood, and mingled grief with their happiness, that he addressed the lord of the place on the subject. For God's sake, he said, fair gentle sir, will you kindly inform me why you have thus honoured me, and shown at once such joy and such heaviness? Yes, if you desire to know, but it would be better for you to desire ignorance and silence. I will never tell you willingly anything to cause you grief. Allow us to continue to lament, and do you pay no attention to what we do. It would be quite impossible for me to see you sad, and not take it upon my heart. So I desire to know the truth, whatever chagrin may result to me. Well then, he said, I will tell you all. I have suffered much from the giant, who has insisted that I should give him my daughter, who surpasses in beauty all the maidens in the world. This evil giant, whom may God confound, is named Harpin of the Mountain. Not a day passes without his taking all of my possessions upon which he can lay his hands. No one has a better right than I to complain, and to be sorrowful, and to make lament. I might well lose my senses from very grief, for I had six sons who were knights, fairer than any I knew in the world, and the giant has taken all six of them. Before my eyes he killed two of them, and to-morrow he will kill the other four, unless I find someone who will dare to fight him for the deliverance of my sons, or unless I consent to surrender my daughter to him. And he says that when he has her in his possession, he will give her over to be the sport of the vilest and lewdest fellows in his house, for he would scorn to take her now for himself. That is the disaster which awaits me to-morrow, unless the Lord God grant me his aid. So it is no wonder, fair sir, if we are all in tears. But for your sake we strive for the moment to assume as cheerful a countenance as we can. For he is a fool who attracts a gentleman to his presence, and then does not honour him. And you seem to be a very perfect gentleman. Now I have told you the entire story of our great distress. Neither in town nor in fortress has the giant left us anything except what we have here. If you had noticed, you must have seen this evening, that he has not left us so much as an egg, except these walls which are new, for he has raised the entire town. When he had plundered all he wished, he set fire to what remained. In this way he has done me many an evil turn. My lord Yvain listened to all that his host told him, and when he had heard it all, he was pleased to answer, Sire, I am sorry and distressed about this trouble of yours, but I marvel greatly that you have not asked assistance at good King Arthur's court. There is no man so mighty that he could not find at his court some who would be glad to try their strength with his. Then the wealthy man reveals and explains to him that he would have had efficient help if he had known where to find my lord Gawain. He would not have failed me upon this occasion, for my wife is his own sister. But a knight from a strange land who went to court to seek the king's wife has led her away. However, he could not have gotten possession of her by any means of his own invention, had it not been for Kay, who so befooled the king that he gave the queen into his charge and placed her under his protection. 
he was a fool and she imprudent to entrust herself to his escort. And I am the one who suffers and loses in all this, for it is certain that my excellent Lord Gawain would have made haste to come here, had he known the facts, for the sake of his nephews and his niece. But he knows nothing of it, wherefore I am so distressed that my heart is almost breaking, for he has gone in pursuit of him, to whom may God bring shame and woe for having led the queen away. While listening to this recital, my lord Yvain does not cease to sigh. Inspired by the pity which he feels, he makes this reply. Fair gentle sire, I would gladly undertake this perilous adventure, if the giant and your son should arrive to-morrow, in time to cause me no delay, for to-morrow at noon I shall be somewhere else, in accordance with a promise I have made. Once for all, fair sire, the good man said, I thank you a hundred thousand times for your willingness. And all the people of the house likewise expressed their gratitude. End of section five.